Read our call to worship this morning from Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen. Let's sing uh, Behold Him. We, we sang this last week in the set, and um, just felt like it would be appropriate to do for the month of December. So let's sing this together.
Christ the Lord. Be seated. It's good to be back with you guys this morning. My name's Andrew, by the way. We were gone for a little bit. <laughs> Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we come to you now as, a, as a, just a local body of believers, a group of people that you have brought together by your divine providence uh, to live life together, to praise you together, Lord, to be there for each other, to help each other, uh, to lift up each other and to sharpen each other, Lord. And uh, to be the family that you've called us to be. And Lord, I pray that right now for our church. That you would burden our hearts with a love for our brother and sister. Lord, for the people here and the people who call themselves members of Pleasant View Baptist. That, that we would be seeking ways to love each other. Lord, to exhibit that to the world around us. And Lord, with that, we lift up some of our... our uh, our fellow saints who've been hurt and sick and, and, Lord, who are down physically. Lord, we lift up uh, uh, Walt Weeks to you who's been in the hospital and has been, has been ill and weak. And, Lord, uh, even simple tasks are difficult for him right now. We just lift him up, lift the family up as they seek to, uh, uh, to minister to him. We lift up his wife, Lord, that his... Her, her love just amazes me sometimes, at, at her love for her family and uh, the care that she gives them, uh, anything that they need. Lord, uh, we, we praise you this morning for answers to prayer with Ryan Martin and him being uh, on the road to recovery, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that this is the time that he and his wife and others are growing closer and closer to you. And we realize how fragile life is, God. And, Lord, how uh, so many things have to fall together for us to be physically alive on this earth. And, Lord, you are the one who holds all that glue together. Lord, I, I praise you for my own mom, uh, Jerry Foy, who's recovering from her hip replacement and no longer in so much pain and uh, able to do the things that she loves to do for her family. Lord, we lift up uh, the family of, uh, of Dan Beckman to you. Uh, Gary's brother, who we've seen here so many times, he used to bring him here. Uh, our brother Gary, who's gone to be with you, Lord, who has recently passed away. And Lord, uh, we just lift that the Beckman family up to you, who have lost yet another. Uh, Lord, we lift up the family of uh, uh, Angie Dixon's family, who uh, they lost uh, Naomi uh, Flanagan uh, just last night, uh, uh, lovingly known as Aunt Mutt. You know, we've been we've been praying. Praying for them, and Lord, we hurt for, for them. We hurt with our sister, uh, Angie, uh, through this loss. Lord, um, help us to be that loving church and to reach out in these times of need for these families. Lord, I can't help but think of the, the seasoned saints among us who have been here serving you so long who have needs, Lord, that so often they don't mention them, but Lord, we know they're there. Lord, these people who have been loving you and serving you and... Uh, loving your church before many of us were even born. Lord, we, we honor them, and we consider it a privilege to call them brother and sister in Christ. Lord, um, uh, I lift up our, our, our puppet uh, team to you and the presentation that's soon to, soon to come. Lord, I, I pray for endurance. Uh, I pray for uh, hearts that are set on you with a desire that your message of, of love and reconciliation to the world would be made known the true message of what, of what it meant that Christ came to be with us, uh, Emmanuel, Christ among us. And Lord, um, I pray that for the souls of the people who will be here, that they would, that message would ring true. And Lord, that we would not be known simply as the church that does that puppet show, but Lord, that we are that church that loves them. Lord, that we exhibit your love, even in our imperfections and inabilities and Lord, our shortcomings. That each morning, just as we prayed and we learned about in Sunday school this morning, that we would get up each morning, um, first of all, acknowledging you and acknowledging your love for us and asking you to renew our love for you and in turn show that love to the people you have put in our path. 
the people in our lives. Lord, not just in our immediate family, but in our church, in our workplace, in our schools, in our home, uh, hometowns, Lord. There's so much need. And Lord, you do put those things in front of us. Lord, just ask you um, in this world of polarization and conflict and disease, Lord, that your love and majesty would ring true to the people who need to hear it. Lord, and that that would be what motivates us, not just in this season, but throughout the year as we seek to, to exhibit that love and genuinely demonstrate that love in our actions to the people around us. Lord, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Would you open up your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 21? We're going to look this morning at verses 8 through the end of the chapter and try to finish this out. My plan is to jump into Genesis 22 next week, start on that, and then the uh, week after that probably go to one of the Gospels and the story of the birth of Christ. And on Christmas Day, yes, we will be meeting. Um, we hope you'll join us to worship the Lord. We're going to have a very special time together of, of a Christmas communion here. I will abbreviate the service a little bit, but um, we want to we also take time to, to worship the Lord. That's, this is what Christmas is all about. It's worshiping the King. So... Uh, We'll serve communion in a little bit different way. We'll have some tables up here and have our, our elders and deacons helping to serve you um, and make it a little bit different of a service. So I, I pray that you will, you'll be here for that on Christmas morning. Would you stand and let's read Genesis chapter 21, verse 8 through the end of the chapter. Isaac has just been born, and verse 8 says, The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah, the son of, of, of Hagar the Egyptian, I'm sorry, Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. And she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent, with, and, and sent her way. And she sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife, for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, 
Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of the men swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Father, would you please add your blessing to the reading of your word? And would you please add our understanding to the the proclamation of your word that we would know how this applies to us? Oh God, just work by your spirit in the hearts of these people and in the hearts of this preacher. And Lord, just be blessed and glorified today through your word we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is The Everlasting God. If you get to the end of the chapter there in in verse 33, Abraham calls him Yahweh El Olam, which is the everlasting God. He's pointing out something about the everlasting God, the unchanging God, the God who makes covenants, who He doesn't go back on. He's everlasting. He's able to fulfill these covenants. So there's really two different sections, two different stories that we've read today. There's the story of Ishmael and Hagar being put out into the desert. And as we talked about last week, you know, Paul really describes this and uses this, that story as an allegory to talk about faith and the difference between grace and, and the law, or faith and the law, that kind of thing. And, and he uses that story to, to draw some contrast there. Um, so we're going to hone in on that a little bit more today. But the Galatians explanation is going to be last week. I'm not going to get too much into that anymore this week. And then there's this really obscure story, like, what do you do with this preacher? Where Abimelech shows up again. And like, what, what's going on here? I mean, why is this in the Bible? And so we're going to try to dig in and try to figure out why it is in the Bible. Let me start out with just reading this. Do you remember when God came to Abraham to promise him the birth of Isaac? That's in chapter 17, verse 18. And Abraham responds, because he just doesn't get it yet. He thinks he's too old. He knows God's promised it, but he's hoping that the promise is going to land on Ishmael. Verse seven, uh, chapter 17, verse 18. Oh, that Ishmael light might live before you. Uh, what he meant was, oh, that Ishmael might be the heir of the covenant you have made. Oh, that all the promises you have made, may they come through Ishmael. That was Abraham's idea. That shows us right there how much this father loved this son. Ishmael loved, or Abraham loved Ishmael and So when Sarah asks him uh, to cast out his own son, what she's saying is cast him out and never look upon him again. Never see him again. That parting must have been brutal to Abraham. Can you imagine that, dads? The sons that you you love, that, you know, 
your wife tells you, just get him out of here and never look upon him again. And if you've really loved him, there's going to be some heartbrokenness there. Think, think about that. I mean, this isn't just some fairy tale story and there's no emotions involved. This was brutal to Abraham. This father was summoned to send out a boy that he loves and will never see him again. And the harder part then is that God then tells Abraham to heed the words of his wife. Now, now guys, that's not a doctrinal principle there every time. But that is, in, in this, this instance here, the Lord says, you need to listen. You need to listen to what your wife has said. His mind must have wondered how this would play out as he sent the boy into the, in, into the wilderness, the desert wilderness, into the heat, perhaps to die, never to be reunited. And, and I, I, I keep bringing this up because I want you to feel the heaviness that Abraham must have felt. No matter what Sarah feels about Ishmael and Hagar right now, Abraham loves the boy. And his love for his son breaks his heart at the thought of losing him. It's God himself that gives assurance to Abraham and says, I care. I care about this. You need to do what your wife said, but I, I care. I will take care of your boy. I know it's hard for you to understand what Sarah is saying to you right now, and she may even be saying it for the wrong reasons, the wrong motives. She despises Hagar now. She despises this boy. But what Sarah is saying, God says, is a part of my plan. I care. And we hear this story, and we can't believe that this could be God's plan. You know what you're saying there? I, I believe I'm kinder than God. I'm kinder than God. We can't believe it's his plan to do this. But he is kinder to Ishmael than Sarah is. And we think also we are kinder than God, but we're not. God's plan is perfect. God's plan is all flows out of his kindness, his love. Sometimes we don't get that. But God is kind. So as they're out in the middle of the, of, of the desert, nowhere, she has to shoulder, and Hagar shoulders him. There's, there's some challenge in the Scripture because probably Hagar was about 15 years old. And if you read through some of the text, it says they, she carries him and she lays him. That's the idea you get in just reading the text. So scholars have said that it, it's, it's almost like she shouldered him. You know, she, he's so weak that this mama is dragging her 15-year-old boy, holding him up until he collapses under the heat without water. And right there, she lays him under this, this bush. And uh, that's kind of the vision that I, that I get when I read this. Hagar then calls out to the Lord and the everlasting, unchangeable God who cares provides for Hagar and Ishmael. She looks, she sees a well. She fills it up with water. She gives water to the boy. He's renewed with strength. Not only that, the Lord preserves the boy's life. He promises to make Ishmael a great nation. He's already spoken that to Abraham. Now he's speaking it to Hagar. And we're told that the boy or the Lord was with the boy. The Lord was with him. So my question is, what tough situations might you be in right now? And what you can learn for this is the everlasting God is the God who cares. No matter what you think, no matter what the circumstances look like, that's his nature. That's who he is. He's the everlasting God, the God who cares. When you come to a passage like this, especially when we get to the Abimelech section, Again, you might ask, why is this in the Scriptures? And maybe the answer is to show the faithfulness of God in the ordinary dealings of life. Like right now in this room, some of you are feeling abandonment. Some of you are feeling separation from children, from, from friends, from, from somebody. Some of you are experiencing deceit. 
Because when we get to the Abimelech story, that's the whole issue there. The last time Abraham was with Abimelech, what did he do? He tried to deceive him. He lied to him, in essence. So some of you are experiencing deceit, mistrust, tensions. If your wife is on your back about something or your husband is on your back about something or your boss is on your back about something, tensions. That's called life. So the picture here is that God meets us in the ordinary dealings of life. And he is the everlasting God. It didn't take him by surprise. He's everlasting. He knows all from eternity past to eternity future. He cares. And that's, that's kind of the, if, one of the takeaways that I hope you'll take away from this story today. Throughout Abraham's story run two great promises that God had made to him. A son through whom would become a great nation and through whose descendants all the nations would be blessed. We see that in chapter 21, right? The fulfillment of that in Isaac. And a land where his descendants would live. Isn't it interesting that this Philistine king comes to him wanting peace? Last time... When he saw Abimelech, he tried to twist things, take things under his own control, lie and deceive about his wife because he was fearful of this Philistine king. Now the king comes to him because this is God's doing and seeks peace. It's interesting. So as God was bringing about both of these promises in his perfect timing, um, Abraham, you have to remember, often resorted to human schemes to help God out. And Abraham is us. We, we often resort to human schemes to try to get God's will done faster. Or we imagine God's will the way we want to imagine it, and it's not really God's will, so we, we force matters. Remember, with God's promise of offspring, Abraham took things into his own hand. That's when he was introduced to Hagar and produced Ishmael with regard to the land here in the last part of chapter 21. Um, last time, he, he was scared of this Philistine king and lied about his wife. But in today's verses, without Abraham's prompting, Isaac is born, Ishmael is put away, and Abimelech comes seeking peace so that they can occupy the land together. God is at work in this story. By God's plan and His work and His way, Abraham receives from God what he had previously tried to get through deception, through trying out of his own understanding. So it's interesting how God does all of this when we let God be God, we let God work. So from the text, i got three points here that we're going to work through this morning. I'm going to give them to you all right now, and then we'll work, work our way down through them. Number one, faith grows through pain. As God's faithfulness strengthens Abraham to obey. I want you to feel Abraham's pain at the separation between Ishmael and Abraham. If you don't feel that pain enough, go to the next chapter and read where now the son of promise is being asked by God to be sacrificed. So pain, that's how, that's how God is using, that is what God is using in Abraham's life right now to help him see that I'm faithful. I'm faithful. I will do what I say. It will be done. My will will be done. Second point, God's faithfulness redeems Abraham from disgrace and uses him to display his glory. So the last time Abimelech and Abraham met, it was a disgraceful situation. He lied about his wife. God gave the king a dream and said, you better, you better not touch this woman or you're as good as dead. That's disgraceful. So he's upset with Abraham and of course he has to go to him and God says, go to the prophet and make sure he prays for you to re remove this curse that has fallen upon you of barrenness. So he does, but he can't be very happy with Abraham. He's, Abraham has been disgraced because he lied. He should have been disgraced. 
And, and sometimes you disgrace yourself. And you think, God's done with me. That's it. I'm disgraced. I've been disgraced. I'm just going to live in, in, in this mess the rest of my life. Disgraced. But that's not what happens here. God takes disgrace and he redeems it to be a tool of his grace in the lives of other people. God's not done with you yet. If he's, if he's called you, if you're saved, if you belong to him, and you've messed up, and you've messed up really bad, and it's brought shame to you and your family, that kind of thing, and you're thinking, I'm done. God's done with me, and I'm done with this. That's not what happened in this story. As a matter of fact, God brings the king back to Abraham here, and Abraham becomes an agent of grace here and truthfulness. Last time he lied, this time he's truthful with the king. Yeah, by the way, one of your guys is claiming the well that I dug. He brings it up. Why would you even bring that up to a Philistine king with his commander of the army standing right beside him? You know, almost, almost as a picture of the Philistines had, humanly speaking, the force and the military might to do anything they wanted to Abraham. But what they, they knew they couldn't do anything to Abraham. Why? Because God is with you. And then the third point here, is the everlasting God is faithful to fulfill his promises and bring peace to Abraham. So let's look at that first one, this pain, for just a minute. Let's look at the text, verses 8 through 14. Sarah said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham. Now, I'm not sure what translations are in the room right now. This is the ESV. But the Hebrew word is yara. Yara, it means to be broken. Abraham is broken to fear. He's fearful. He's grievous that this thing would be asked of him. He wasn't just displeased here. There, it's a deeper, deeper word. And, 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 and then the answer, the very next phrase but God, the word for God there is Elohim, which is the supreme God. We're getting the word Yahweh in the mix here in today's passage. We're getting the word Elohim, the Hebrew word, the supreme God, Elohim. And we're also getting El Elam in there. Three, three names for God that we're seeing in this text. This is the word Elohim. In other words, Elohim says to Abraham, I'm sorry, yeah, Elohim says to Abraham, don't grieve, don't worry, don't fear. Why? Because I, I am God and I will take care of this boy and his mother. I will take care of them. God's saying, from this point forward, you let go of them, Abraham. I will take care of Ishmael. He's no longer your responsibility I will be a father to the fatherless. I will care for him. So God spoke to Abraham and later to Hagar. Again, this promise that he also would become a great nation. Ishmael had a future. You don't need to worry about him. He's not going to die in the desert. I am God and I will take care of he and his mother. So God's care for the boy and God's faithfulness in this is very clear. To Abraham. And imagine what a faith builder that would be. I mean, God says it to all of us. Your, your children really aren't yours. Ultimately, they're God's, right? And we think we can control every little thing that goes on in their life, but we can't, honestly, if we get on. And, but, but, but God says, I'll take care of them. I'll watch over them. You pray for them. You trust me with them. So God, uh, the other lesson here is, is that God sometimes separates us from things and maybe even people that we love so that we will depend on Him and, and grow in our faith or trust in Him. That's one of the things that we learn from this passage. God had separated Abraham from Ishmael so that his heart would be holy God's. One, one commentary that I read is that God has moved Ishmael out of the way so that Abraham's faith must be built in the very trial of trusting that the whole of his hopes are in the hands of God. 
There's another part of that commentary that says God, God takes Ishmael out of the way so that he has also no backup plan. And he's about ready to, to shake up his faith in the next chapter because he's about ready to say, go sacrifice Isaac. And there's no backup plan. We have to trust God. We have to trust God. And that maybe is one of the reasons all this went down the way it did. Matter of fact, Hebrews 11 sort of mentions it in chapter 17 through 19. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his own son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did raise him back. So in other words, the faith of Abraham is growing through all of these painful things that are going on in his life. He's learning to trust God because he can't do anything about it, number one. He can't fix this. Secondly, he's looking to God for strength. And, and the Hebrew writer says by the time he got to the sacrifice of Isaac, he was about ready to put the knife in because he, he knew that, that the promise was through Isaac. And if, and if he puts the knife into him, God's going to raise him up from the dead. It's amazing how his faith is growing here because we've seen wishy-washy Abraham. Some of you, if you're like me, we've read these stories and we've been frustrated with this guy who's called the father of our faith. It's like, what's up with that? And yet, it's all of us. How are we going to grow in our faith? Pain. Unfortunately, pain. Perseverance through pain. Suffering. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials because you know those trials are working to something better. Faith. Faith. Let faith have its perfect work. Pain, suffering, loss, separation, those kind of things that we hate, we despise. No one's going to pray for that today in their life. I'm not going to, I'm not, don't pray for me that I'd be separated from someone I love, please. And yet, when the natural course of life happens, that's what we see it as, natural. God is doing something supernatural above us. He's not forgotten you. So, perhaps there's something, again, like this experience going on in your life right now. Some hope, some dream, some prayer. And the Lord doesn't provide for you what you thought He was going to provide for you. Or... The Lord took away from you something that you thought he would never take away from you. Maybe you think that the Lord is withholding something good from you that you should have. It might be that just as it is in the case of Abraham and Ishmael, the Lord is rather not taking something away, but preparing you for a greater blessing, for a building up of your faith. And may we trust Yahweh, and look to Him. But pain does have a way of shifting our focus to God and growing our faith. So if you're going through something painful, hurtful right now, God's not forgotten you. Trust in Him. Call out to Him, just like Hagar did, just like the boy did. Lord, I need you. God, I need you. He cares. He will sustain you. He may not take away the pain, but He'll sustain you. Point number two, God, God's faithfulness redeems Abraham from disgrace and uses him to display his glory. So now we're going to go to the second story. Verses 22 through 24, look at the verses there. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Can you imagine the first thing that the Scripture records that they speak to Abraham is God is with you in all that you do. Wow. Anybody ever had a greeting like that? Someone walks up to you and said, there's something different about you. God is with you in all that you do. I can see God working in your life. I don't even believe in God. I'm a Philistine king. I do what I want on my terms whenever I want it. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is God is with you, Abraham. Now the last 
here's the big confusing thing about that. The last time we hear about Abimelech, just a couple of chapters back, it was Abraham deceiving him, lying to him about his wife that almost got him killed. And this is the first thing that he sees and hears. God is with you in all that you do. Genesis graciously addresses the self-created mess of Abraham and Sarah. The late British scholar Griffith Thomas writes, God is taking up the tangled threads of his servants' lives, weaving them into his own divine pattern and overruling everything for his good and glory. The truth is, without past failures, affliction, hardship, we would be trivial, superficial people with shallow faith. So God works in and through the setbacks of our lives to mature our faith. He turns disgrace and disgraces into a conduit for His grace. The last meeting again between these two ended in disgrace and a rebuke for Abraham. Why did you do this to me? Why did you, why did you lie to me about your wife? What's, and what's Abraham do? Does he repent right then? No, he says, oh, well, technically she, she was, she's my sister. He, does, he tries to cover it up as if he's doing something right. So that's kind of where we left him with Abimelech. Abimelech is told by God to go to him and ask him to pray for you so that this curse might be lifted. But that must have been hard too. But this dream must have been so vivid God speaking to Abimelech must have been so powerful that he was willing to do anything to get right with this God who said, I'm going to zap you. So that's the last meeting. This meeting, he shows up and he says, God is with you in whatever you do. I want peace with you. <laughs> I want peace with you. He aimed for peace. That's what he aimed for. Let's face it, Abraham blew his witness as the servant of Yahweh, the eternal one, the, the one true and living God in the first meeting. And he's disgraced and defeated in a life that is supposed to be reflecting the glory of this one who's shown up and called him out and told him he'd be a great, a great, he would, he would, out of him would come a great people. And, and yet he's messing things up left and right but God's going to redeem him here. Why? Because God is true. God is faithful. God is a God of redemption. He's the God of another chance. Not has nothing to do with Abraham here. He's going to work through Abraham, but this is God's name on the line here. So you notice the providence of God here that would bring these two together again. He comes the way the Scripture reads he approaches or he is the one that comes to Abraham at this point. Well, Abraham learned to be like his heavenly father this time around, keeping his word, keeping his honor, because God keeps his word and God is honorable. Has God been sanctifying Abraham, growing him in his faith? It seems like from chapter to chapter, we think so. Oh, maybe not. We think so, maybe not. But before you're too hard on Abraham, what I want you to do is go home today and stare at yourself for two hours in the mirror and, and, and reminisce about your spiritual walk over the last couple of years. Because it's been a couple of years since Abimelech's from the Scriptures. It's been a couple of years. I mean, Isaac's, wasn't born the last time, right, when he was meeting with Abimelech. That's the, that was the, one of the whole issues. If Abimelech would have taken Sarah as his wife. So Isaac's not born. Now Isaac's born and weaned. So it's been about two years since this last visit, two or three. It's interesting what God is revealing to Abimelech here. God is with you. I think God's revealing that to him. God is with you in all that you do. Because he didn't get it from his last visit from Abraham. What does that mean, God is with you? I think God's hand of blessing was obvious on Abraham. Now, there were earthly blessings that were obvious. He had a lot of livestock. He had a lot of servants. 
He had a lot of stuff. But the man just had a baby at 100 years old. And I, 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 the text doesn't point this out, but I'm sure that was news that wasn't kept quiet. So the earthly blessings and success were obvious, but I think there's this spiritual blessing on this man that Abimelech recognizes, that he had a miracle baby. There was a, he was, and this miracle baby was the son of, of, of a promise from God. God helps Abimelech and his commanders see that Abraham's God is blessing Abraham. Look at verse 23. There's another issue, though. Now, therefore, swear to me here. So he sees God's blessing, but he's not quite sure if he can trust Abraham yet. He's trusting God because look, 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 see, he's Philistine. And look what he tells him. Swear by God. Swear by Elohim again, the supreme God, the God that you serve, you swear by the God that you serve, Elohim, that you will not deal falsely with me or my descendants or my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. I will swear. Now, words are vain, right? Abraham's used words in the past to deceive people. So that, that's this whole seven U's and, and bringing them. It's, it, it's this picture of a similar covenant that we heard when God came down and, and, and they cut these animals in half and all that kind of thing. Like Abraham's saying, I'm swearing by my own life before my God, and here's animals to prove it, that, that what I say, I will do this time. Abimelech seems to to fear God, though, here more than he fears Abraham. And why? Because he remembers the violent dream that he had. He remembers the curse upon the shut wombs of the women of his house that we saw back in chapter 20, verse 18. God brings their paths together again, though, this time for peace in the heart of Abimelech. Swear to me, Abraham, by Elohim, the supreme God, that you will deal truth, truthfully with me without any deception this time, and, and I just want to say that trust is a hard thing to gain back, right? If you break your trust with somebody, husbands, you've broken your trust with your wife before, and you want her just to forget and move on. But it's hard for her. You've broken your trust with children before, your children. Wives, you've broken trust with husbands. Broken trust is a hard thing to get back. But I love how Abimelech looks past that to God. He doesn't trust Abraham, <laughs> humanly speaking. That's why he says, you swear by your God, because I know what your God can do. I've dealt with your God before. He's dealt with me. I know that. So swear to me, Abraham, by Elohim, because trust is a hard thing to gain back. Deceitfulness is a hard thing to overcome in relationship. The more you... Twist things, and you know, why didn't outright lie? You know, you get, get guys are great with, with this to their wives. We, we get them on a technicality, right? Just like Abraham did before. Deceitfulness is a hard thing to overcome in a relationship. But God can overcome it because he did right here. He didn't trust Abraham per se, but he saw God's hand of blessing. And that brings about a mixed witness in him. God's faithfulness redeems Abraham from disgrace, though, and uses him. Look at this. God takes the disgraceful actions of deceit and lying from the last meeting and now uses Abraham as an instrument of his grace, as an instrument of peace. And only God can do something like that. Are you in conflict with people right now? And you're working every angle to try to not be in conflict with people? And all those, and it's good to try. And it's good to, you know, there's a, there's a verse in Scripture that we're to live peaceably with all men as much as it has to do with us. But you can't make somebody be at peace with you. The only thing we can do about that is pray. 
And it's interesting how God brings Abimelech back to him and takes the disgraceful actions of Abraham and now use, is going to use him as an agent of grace. Only God can do something like this. And again, what I see in this story is, is God is redeeming the unfaithful actions of Abraham from the past and using them to reflect the faithfulness of God now. And it was all in his timing and his way. You wonder, you wonder if, if, if the last meeting, if he would have just trusted God with this instead of lying about his wife and doing all those other things, it might have been a whole different outcome. But we just wonder about that because there's no answer. This is all God's sovereign plan, and it's all part of the pain that, and, and, and the disgrace and all those things that, that Abraham has to deal with in order to, to strengthen his faith because there's a big one coming next chapter. So when Abraham did things according to the flesh in their first meeting, there was disgrace. Now the king approaches Abraham desiring peaceful cohabitation in the land. This time, Abraham is doing things according to God's plan, not his plan. And God was fulfilling his promise at the same time of a land. And Abraham has a new sense of confidence in the Lord. So God's handling the promise, uh, or, or handing the promised land to Abraham peacefully as this patriarch learns to do things God's way and in God's time. That brings us to the last point. The everlasting God is faithful to fulfill his promises and brings peace. So it's over a well, and wells are pretty important in the desert. And I love the, the, the first story that we read, again, in this chapter. It was over water, wasn't it? Water we need physically to sustain us in life. They needed water. Is over a well. It's pretty important. So they shake hands. They do this treaty thing, the covenant thing with the, with the sheep, the you sheep, and, and, and they do this so that Abimelech knows that, hey, look, I'm doing everything I can do, Abraham's saying, to show you I mean what I say here. All that. And after they shake hands and do that, Abraham has the guts to go back and say, there is one thing, since we're in a peace treaty now. <laughs> There's one thing I want to talk to you about. Your people are saying that this well in the middle of the desert, and I need this well, that they dug it, that it's their well. They're not letting us use it. And Abimelech's already on guard because he doesn't want God dealing with him. Just, hey, this is the first time I've heard it. You know, I haven't heard it up until this point. I didn't know anything about it. I, know what, I don't know what you're talking about, and I didn't know anything about it, but we'll get it taken care of. And then they do the covenant and, and everything. And the, and the well, Abraham is able to secure as a sustainable part of living there in peace, in the desert, where he's living. But it's interesting that at the end of all this, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham plants a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of Yahweh, El Olam, the everlasting God. Abraham worships at the end of it again. Every time God has a victory, or Abraham, it seems like he takes the appropriate moment, time, to, to, to plant a landmark or build an altar or do something that's a visual picture, a reminder to him that God is faithful. God is, ever, in this instance, God is everlasting. He plants this tamarisk tree and he says, the Lord, he is the everlasting God. Abraham worships God. He recognizes the unchanging eternality of Yahweh. He doesn't change. The covenant he kept all along that spoke several chapters ago to Abraham, he is fulfilling it. He is doing what he says. He doesn't change. He doesn't veer off. He doesn't change his plans. God doesn't change his plans. You ever thought about that? God doesn't change his plans. He's got a, a, the mind of God is perfect. 
He plans it out right the first time. He doesn't have to go back and change anything. He doesn't change his plans. He's never, he, he never changes what he's spoken. All, all, the, all the things in Scripture, the commandments, the, the, the attributes of God, all the things that he, he tells us in Scripture doesn't change. This society we live in says that God doesn't mean what he says anymore. Or God didn't really, you know, say that or whatever. They, they change it up. You could go back and if, if, if you want to know about, again, homosexuality or sexuality or, or sex before marriage or whatever, those are, those are the pressing issues. That's the only reason I'm naming those right now. You can go back, and God hasn't changed on those things, and He never will. But we change. Even we as Christians, we, we want to water it down a little bit, and hey, well, you know, Abraham didn't live in the culture that we lived in. Really? He just saw Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. So, so again, I just want you to understand that God doesn't change. That he, and, and this is eternal. This name, El Olam, is eternal. Ever since, there was no beginning of time. That's the mind blower, isn't it? Ever since eternity past into eternity future, what he's given us here is eternal. It's true. It's, it's God. It's who he is. And Abraham bows the knee right here, and he's just overwhelmed with that. He worships God, and he says he is the Lord. He is Yahweh. He is the self-existent, eternal God, who has always been and always will be, he doesn't change. He's eternal. The late pastor James Montgomery Boyce wrote, times change and people change and needs change, but God doesn't change. Genesis 21, 33, Abraham planted this tamarisk tree and he says, Yahweh, you are El Olam a divine designation that's only found right here in Scripture, El Olam. Abraham's use of El Olam has to do with the eternal nature of the covenants and events throughout these past couple of chapters we've been through. Abraham's God was the everlasting one whose purposes will not be thwarted, whose covenants will stand because they're honored by God who is unchanging and everlasting. This awesome view of God is now beginning to inform all of Abraham's dealings. He's going to make some more mistakes as we read on out, but you can see his faith just growing and launching and not questioning God, not lying about his wife, not from here on out. And and, and one commentator wrote, the grinding and polishing of sanctification for old Abraham had been going on for years. The frictions of adversity and failure had been polishing his own soul. Abraham's faith was becoming luminous with divine light. So as we kind of end this thing up this morning, let's go back to the ordinary. Like, none of you would say, I'm like Abraham. I'm going through all the same exact things as Abraham. But Frederick Buckner writes these words, We believe in God, and we have faith. We work, and we goof off. We love, and we dream. We have wonderful times, and we have awful times. We are cruelly hurt, and we hurt others cruelly. We get mad and we get bored and we get scared stiff and we ache with desire. We do all such things, human things, as these. And if our faith is not mainly just window dressing or a lucky rabbit's foot or fire insurance, it is because it grows out of precisely this kind of rich human compost. (laughs) So we're going about life. And in the end, like Paul says, it's all dung. All the achievements, all the money you made, all the nice houses you had, all the cars you drive, all, all, all that stuff is, is just human compost. Let that be the backdrop to the luminous light of an eternal God. 
is perfect in all of his ways. Holy, holy, holy. And he loves this world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe, and of course there's more than that. You know, when I say, you can't even read that verse now without unpacking it to this culture. It's not just some mental sin. It's a loving of God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And seeing the failures of Abraham and the failures of your own life and the common stuff that we just do, seeing the only way I can love God like that is through a son that loved God like that. And his finished work for me on behalf of the times when I don't love God like that, I need I need Jesus. I need God to love God. I love those verses that say, we love him because he first loved us. He is love. So faith doesn't grow in a greenhouse in the, in the, in, you know, these little, it grows when, when stuff's heading towards us at 190 mile an hour and we're trying to get out of the way, you know. And we're making dumb decisions sometimes and we're, we're making good decisions sometimes and we're goofing off sometimes and, you know, and, and other times. But, but just let the backdrop be God is faithful. He is unchanging. He is the everlasting God. I'll just leave with a few takeaways. These are just one sentence takeaways that I wrote down. First one is living a life of integrity and truth before a watching world reflects our Lord. Number two, there is a great obstacle in reflecting God's glory with the lingering poison of deceit or lies in your life. Number three, when we deal with conflict, even with outsiders, we're to pursue peace. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live peaceably with all men and to be holy, without which holiness, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Number four, The Lord provides water in the desert. The desert of your life, the desert of your circumstances, I think would apply here. He's the one that's going to apply or provide the living water. And that reminded me of one last story from Scripture. There was a woman that Jesus met at a well. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink. And he would have given you living water. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is much too deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did all his sons and his flocks and his herds. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water from the well, from that physical well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of more water welling up to eternal life. Jesus came to satisfy the deepest desires of the human hearts. He came to be the focus of our entire lives. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, O Lord. In our text, Abraham calls the Lord the everlasting God, Yahweh El Olam. Our text also speaks of the covenant that Abraham made with Abimelech. He testified to it with seven lambs. One of the things Scripture says God did in eternity was to make a covenant with his people in the blood of the Lamb of God who is this one who says, I'm the living water. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You weren't, you can't. God made you in his image. You only find it in him, the one who made you. So, Father, I pray right now 
that we take these words of the end of chapter 21 of Genesis. And you would drive them deep into our hearts. First off, for those going through pain, I pray they would not necessarily see this as a curse, but that they would see that in this story, several times it was in pain that you revealed yourself mightily to Abraham, giving him blessing and giving him peace in the midst of the undesirable displeasure, as the text says in the ESV, of his life. And so there are some going through displeasure, undesirable things in their lives. May they reach out to you, and may you sustain them, may you encourage them, may you help them right now. Oh, Father, we also see again, Lord, how you take our disgraces and our past, and you are able to somehow, in your powerful, supernatural way, to take our disgraces and turn our own lives into trophies of your grace. You make us agents and dispensers and conduits so that your grace can work through us into the lives of other people. And then the last thing we see is, God, you are eternal. Nothing has taken you off guard here. Just to, just to meditate on that and be overwhelmed with that this week, through all the pressures and things of life, there's not a thing that you didn't see coming for us. And there's not a time when you don't care and you're not with us. So may we look to you and praise you for being the eternal God, the unchanging God who keeps his promises, keeps his covenant, keeps his word from eternity past to eternity future. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Yahweh. Praise your name that you are El Olam. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? <clears throat> the
benediction from 2 Thessalonians 3, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I love that phrase, which, I mean, we draw attention to, it, but uh, the very first verse of that uh, hymn that we just sang, God and sinners reconciled through the blood of Christ, through Jesus Christ. So, amen. But think, think on that. You know, that'll be mind-blowing. As you're looking at yourself for two hours today, think on that. God and sinners reconcile. Amen. <laughs>